My name is Christine Player. Um, I work for CLE Engineering. Our offices are based out of Marion, Mass, and Buzzards Bay. Um, as simple as dredging sounds, it really isn't so simple. Mm -hmm. um, we often run into issues with sediment contaminations, finding a place for dredge sediment to go. Uh, the regulations over the years have become extremely complicated. There's a lot of layers of permitting from a local, state, to federal level. Um, the testing requirements are very stringent. Um, the time of year in which you can dredge is very small because we have to take into consideration our environment in which we're doing our work. So as simple as dredging may seem, I want to take something out of the water and put it someplace else. Um, it, it can get quite complicated and bottom line, it can get very expensive. It's a very costly endeavor and unless you're doing beach nourishment where you're physically seeing this material solving some erosion needs, you never really get to see what you dredge because it's underwater. So this investment, um, oftentimes you can't really go out and look at it like a big ribbon cutting with a, a brand new building or what have you. So um, dredging, I'm calling it Dredging 101 because I'm here just to try to educate you folks about the various um, components that are involved in a dredging program. Um, so Melinda, if you can give me the down arrow. So just to start at the very basic level, what is dredging? And basically it's just excavating in a water body. It could be a harbor, it could be a river, a lake, a pond. Um, and it's for the purpose of removing bottom sediment, whether it's for navigational purposes for certain drafts. Um, it could be for restoration, such as we talk about uh, Tajmu Pond in the Herring Run, trying to get out um, many years of sedimentation that has kind of suffocated the, um, the environment in which the Herring Run exists. It can also be used for site remediation. Uh, New Bedford Harbor, perfect example, the cleanup efforts to get PCBs out of the harbor. And offshore mining, um, not that you see a lot of that around here. I, I wish we could see more of that. Um, but you see that down south oftentimes um, to have a hydraulic dredge offshore to pump clean sand onto their beaches to restore their beaches that have been Im um, impacted by erosion. Uh, sand mining isn't something that we see here in Massachusetts. Um, not that it hasn't been pursued, um, but from a regulatory standpoint, there's a lot of concerns from the other side, meaning your fisheries and the impact of taking um, sand from the ocean and, and p potentially uh, manipulating the habitat so that there's a consequence to solving your erosion problem and that's impacting um, the habitat in which you're getting your sand source from. So that, that's, that's why we dredge. That's okay, down arrow. <laughs> now we have lots of arrows. Um, just to try to give you an overview, uh, step by step, how a dredge program would be implemented. Um, basically, we start with a series of field investigations, and we'll go through all of um, each of these categories in the subsequent slides. <laughs> then we get into um, analyzing and testing the, the physical dredge sediment itself, trying to figure out what it, it consists of, what kind of contaminants may be present. Then once we complete those two steps, we get into the evaluation of dredge, dewatering, and disposal methodologies that can be implemented. Then once we have cleared that hurdle, we're looking at how do we permit this. And every dredging has its own place. There's, sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're difficult, um, but it really is gonna be a, a holistic view of impacts to the environment um, that we have to address and convince the regulators that the, the dredge program that we're putting forth is in compliance with the regulations that we have to work within. And then again, that's local, state, and federal. There's, more regulations than we know what to do with, and they just keep getting bigger and bigger as time goes on. And finally, once the permits are issued, um, we're ready to move forward with uh, implementation of the dredge program itself, at which time the contractor will come on site, and based upon the methods that we've determined to be the most feasible and practical for the, the specific project, we'll move forward and um, do the dredging itself. So to start with field investigations, I know this is really tiny to see, but just trying to give you a sense of what we do. Um, we'll start with a hydrographic survey, and basically that's doing um, a survey in the water. Um, this is our little survey boat, and it's all done with um, beams of light, and we try to detect the mud layer so we know how deep it is to the mud bottom. And on the right-hand side, you'll see this is one of our surveys, and you can see we run a series of lines very close to each other. And basically what that's doing is giving us a contour of the water body bottom. Then what we do is we create these cross-sections. We just slice in plain view. We slice, 
and we determine the dredge step that we want to go to, and we can actually compute the volume of dredge sediment that we need to remove out of the water body that we want to dredge. So our hydrographic survey will give us the areas that require dredging to restore, or um, in the case of a pond, to restore a pond to its natural bottom, or in, in, in the case of a harbor dredging, to restore it to the required design depth uh, to support the navigational needs of, of the harbor itself. Um, next slide. Then we have other types of survey that can complement the hydrographic survey. Um, if we are doing a dredging project where the material is actually going to be disposed of offshore, there's um, two regulated offshore disposal sites in Massachusetts. One's in Cape Cod Bay and the other one's up on the North Shore about 12 miles off of Manchester uh, by the sea. If we're going offshore with the material, essentially the material doesn't have to dewater. It, it's put in a barge. It's towed out by a tug. They open the bottom of the scow, material goes into the ocean. We don't have to worry about land operations. Everything is physically being done on the water, the material is being um, dumped out to sea. However, we don't always get to go to ocean disposal for our projects. So that will bring in um, the need for topographic survey. And that's a land-based survey for us to identify the areas that we're either going to put the dredge sediment on to dewater it and handle it, or in a case of a beach nourishment project, we would actually survey the beach so that we can design a nourishment template in which the material will be placed. And in addition to the land-based survey that we would do, we also um, need to delineate the wetland areas. Um, we are required, um, as one of our permits, to typically get an order of conditions from conservation. So we need to identify wetland areas that will be impacted um, by our dredging projects so that we can um, provide that information in order to get our permits and to show that we're trying to avoid and minimize impact to protected resource areas. Once we finish our survey um, work, then we typically take our hydrographic survey, we find our dredge areas that we need to dredge, and we create a sampling plan. Um, there's particular steps that are involved in creating a sampling plan. It's dependent on the area you're dredging, the volume you're dredging, and what we do is we typically put this plan together, we submit it to either MassDEP or the Army Corps of Engineers, depending if we're going up to, upland is MassDEP, offshore is Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and we get their approval for where we need to sample, um, if we have to test each individual sample by themselves, if we can mix it all together and test it. So they, they give us the direction in terms of how many samples, where we sample, and how we test it. Then we go out. Um, this is a, a VibraCore rig. Um, it doesn't have to be this extravagant. Oftentimes, it's just pushing a tube down in soft sediments. But this is a VibraCore rig, which literally just, again, pushes a tube in, pulls up sediment sample. And we typically penetrate to either in a pond dredge situation to the hard bottom, which is the natural bottom of the pond, or in a navigational dredging project, we'll penetrate to the dredge depth plus an additional foot which is an accepted standard practice in dredging. You always get an extra foot of dredging um, when the contractor moves forward to, to do their work. So once we get um, the sediment samples, we test the samples for grain size analysis. And that's going to give us a sense of the physical makeup of the material. And that is, is it silt, fine, fine silty sand, um, clay material? Is it organic-y? Is it sand? Is it good for nourishment purposes? So that's the physical makeup that we need to understand um, from the dredge material. Then what we do is we test the sediment samples for chemical um, concentrations. Now, there's a gazillion types of chemicals out there, but MassDEP and the Army Corps of Engineers, they both have a targeted list of certain contaminants that all dredge sediment has to be tested for. And then they also have certain thresholds in which these chemical contaminants have to be below for you to reuse the material. If it's contaminated, it might have to go to a landfill. So there's very specific criteria that DEP and the Army Corps of Engineers use to make the judgment of the makeup of that material and the ability to reuse that material in a safe manner that's not any type of public health risk um, or something of the sort there. So if you want to go to the next. So now we've done our survey. We know where we're dredging. We know how much we're dredging. We know what our, our sediment contains. We know what it's made up of. So now we need to figure out what, what is the best methods to dredge this material if we need to get the water out of the material so the material can be reused and it's dry to reuse. And then where is it going to go? And it's all a function, again, of the physical and chemical composition of the sediment that we determine through our testing. 
how much material we have to deal with. And then if we're talking about putting this material somewhere up on land, we've got to get it from water to land. So we need to know how much area do we need to dewater the sediments, handle the sediments, and in some cases, how much area can, if for a beach nourishment project, how much area are we nourishing directly on the beach? So we go through the different steps and we'll start with dredging because there's two types of dredging um, opportunities mm -hmm. to implement. There's a mechanical dredging operation and then there's a hydraulic dredging operation. Mm -hmm. So if you can go to the next. First I'll talk about mechanical dredging. Um, not sure if any of you folks have seen dredging before, so forgive me if it's as simple as it is here, but just trying to get everyone up to speed. Um, mechanical dredging is basically done on a side-by-side -side operation. And there's, if you look at the top slide, there's a barge in which either an excavator or below a crane will sit and the barge is actually spudded down so it can't move. And then the material is excavated and next to it is the containment um, barge or the bottom would be a dump scow that would be going offshore. So that basically is an in the wet mechanical operation and once the materials are put into the containment barge or the scow, then it's towed either to land for offloading or in the case of a dump scow, it's towed off to sea, out to sea to um, discharge it into the ocean. So that's an in the wet mechanical dredge. Another mechanical dredging um, operation can be done in the dry. Um, haven't seen it that often, but it can be beneficial in the right situation in which more from an, up, uh, an inland type of pond project or um, some water body where you can physically drain the water out of the water body. So what you're seeing here is a pond that we got all the water out of and then we crawled in an excavator, we let the material basically dewater right in the pond and then the material was stockpiled and then put into trucks and it was hauled away. In that particular job, um, the material was reused um, for an athletic field. Um, so it can be done in the dry, so from a mechanical sense, you're, you're basically dewatering the water body itself. Obviously the ocean doesn't lend itself well, well to doing something like that, but in the right case, um, it could be a, a beneficial method to use for some of the projects that we, we do do. Um, basically a mechanical dredge, it's good for hard pack material. Um, oftentimes in harbor dredging we encounter lots of debris, abandoned moorings, fishing lines, grocery carts, I mean, you name it, you can find it in the harbors. Um, so you, you've got that capability with a mechanical dredge. If we get into finer grain material, oftentimes through the regulatory process, they're telling us what type of bucket we need to take the material out of. Um, there's special buckets that minimize um, the, the fines from seeping out of the bucket so we're not basically uh, dredging but everything's being released. Once we pick it up from the bottom, it's all released in the water column. So there's special buckets you can use to minimize that. Um, it's ideal for offshore disposal in that you're just basically doing everything on the water. You've got your, your dredge barge, you've got your scow in the water, the scow goes off to sea, perfect. You don't have to put it on land. Nice, simple operation. I wish all our projects could be that simple. Um, there is uh, reduced water content when you mechanically dredge as opposed to hydraulic dredging, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so a lot of the water comes out as you, you lift up through the water column. You're, you're, you're containing more sediment than you are water. So from a dewatering standpoint, when you use a mechanical dredge, there's not as much water you have to deal with to dry it out. Um, one of the disadvantages to mechanical dredging um, is that there's a little more turbidity during the construction process. It's pretty much considered a temporary situation um, where the bucket is hitting the bottom, the fines are kind of spreading out. So it's, it, it, it just has a little more temporary turbidity and sediment suspension that occurs during the construction period. But over time, those sediments will settle out. Um, and oftentimes through your regulatory process, um, certain measures such as silk curtains and other things will be speci specifically identified in the permit to try to minimize um, turbidity. It's something um, nobody wants to see. Um, it doesn't look too pretty. And um, also because if, if it's significant and there's significant current carrying things down harbor, there could be species in the water. So we all have to be conscious of the whole operation in terms of the goal to dredge and get your material out, but also not to impact the surrounding environment. Next slide. Hydraulic dredging. Um, this, this situation, I'm sure you've, some of you folks know the Eggertown dredge, so I'm sure, I, I hope some of you have been able to see the operation. Uh, we recently um, were involved in the, the pond dredging over at Sendig and Tackett a few years ago um, with the Eggertown dredge. 
Um, this here is actually the Barnstable County dredge. Um, it's just a small, very small machine that literally just floats on a, a like a zip line oftentimes. Um, but you can see the cutter head coming off to the left here, and it's an arm that physically has a rotating cutter head, and that goes down into the water. It cuts the material, and it sucks it up like a vacuum cleaner. And then it goes into a pipeline. You can't really see it on the back side, but on the other end here, this pipeline floats um, across the water body, comes on shore, and in this case, it was beach nourishment. So we just put the pipeline on the beach, let the material flow out, the water drains, and I don't have the dry picture of the sediment, but it was nice, clean, white material. Um, and it's left on the beach. So hydraulic dredging, very little turbidity because it, it's like a vacuum cleaner. It's sucking up everything as opposed to a, a big bucket hitting the sediment and generating turbidity. Um, it's very effective for fine grain sediments, again, because it has that sucking capability. The disadvantage with hydraulic dredging is when you suck up your sediments, 80% um, of it's water and 20% of it is the sediment itself. So what you're creating is a slurry which is pumped through that pipeline, as you can see it coming out. I mean, that's pretty much just water by the looks of it. So you've got to, unless it's going to be used for nourishment, it can be pumped directly on the beach and drain on the beach. You've got to deal with that water if you're going to use this material for other purposes at an upland location. So dewatering becomes um, kind of a, a, another component that you'd have to address in some of these types of dredging projects. And we'll do a little bit on dewatering next. And then, the beauty of a hydraulic dredge is you can pump two to four miles. Um, we did a job where we recently pumped, it was a little over two miles. Um, they have boosters that can actually physically help move the sediment in the pipeline. But um, it can get to great distances from where you're dredging and get it to where you need it to go without having to have a land-based operation. You don't have to have trucks. You don't have to move this stuff. You can just pump it right to where you want it to go. So that's a great advantage in terms of if you have a nearby beach that needs nourishment. Um, you can just get that pipeline, go right there, and it's on the beach, and it dries out, and final grade the beach, and it can be that simple. And no trucking, and no traffic, and all those other things that can come with a land-based operation. Sediment dewatering is, is probably the evil of all dredging. <laughs> um, it's essentially getting the water out of the sediment so that it's dry, so that it can be put in trucks, and so that it can be reused or in, in the case of contaminated sediments, so it can be um, safely disposed um, at a landfill facility. Um, once you get into sediment dewatering, what you really need to figure out is, how much land area do I have to use to get the water out of here? What, and that will come down to the types of methods you'll use. And how much time do I have? Um, these materials that are very, very fine grained, uh, the water tends not to come out of it. I mean, think of clay, it's wet, and that water does not just naturally come out of clay. When you get into a cobbly, gravelly sand, like you're at the beach, if you just scoop sand out of the water, the, the water just drains out of the sand. So time is a real big question mark in terms of your dewatering um, operation in that if you're using a parcel of land, oftentimes, um, well, most of the times we're dredging in the winter because that's the only time of year that we're permitted to dredge. So a lot of times we have areas that are big enough to do what we need to do, and they're parks or they're, they're, they're more recreational, seasonal type of uh, facilities that are good for four months. And if I can't get this stuff dry in four months, now I have all this dredge material sitting on a baseball field, and you've just created a, another headache on top of all the headaches that you usually get with dredging to begin with. So um, basically land area and time are a real major component in going through a dewatering operation. So I'm just going to go through um, several dewatering uh, types of dewatering that we, we can use. Um, this is the good old fashioned conventional gravity works, um, pump it in a, a, a basin and just let the sediment settle out. Um, this site is actually in Barnstable Harbor. Um, they actually have, it's a, it looks like a dune, but it's actually a containment basin in which they hollow out the middle of the dune and they pump in dredge sediment. And you can see the dredge line coming into the hole. That's the middle of the artificial dune. Um, the next slide is the opposite end of this containment basin. That's a sluice gate. So what happens is the sediment gets pumped in at one end, and it drains. And as, as it moves down towards that outfall box, uh, the, out, the outflow box, the sediments are coming out of the water. And then the water, you can see the water here, it comes out the other end. There's pipelines that go back into the harbor, and the water's discharged, but all the sediment, as you can see in the last slide, stays within the basin. So that's just good old-fashioned conventional dewatering. 
The problem with that is you need a real big area of land to do this. Because remember, we're not just putting in sediment. We've got to have a big enough area to contain the water. And there's lots of volume of water on top of the sediments that we have to handle. The dewatering time is, again, dependent on the type of material I'm pumping. If it's very, very fine grain, it's going to stay in suspension longer. It's going to take longer for it to fall out of the water column, making you, you have to actually have a bigger containment basin to give it enough time to settle out. Um, another issue that can arise is odor problems. Um, usually it's the smell of low tide, which I think everyone can appreciate. But for some reason, when it's during a dredging project, it's not low, that smell of low tide. Now it's a, a serious problem. But odor, odor can be an issue, especially once the sediments do start to dewater and you don't have that water cover. Um, but there are chemicals that can be added to control odor. Lime is something that's often added, believe it or not, to just neutralize. And, and that will take out a lot of the smell of dredge sediment. And we can actually put in chemical additives. There's flocculants that can be added to help accelerate those particles to fall out of the water so that the water can just proceed on and um, go out to the outfall pipe. Next slide. Oh, just back up one, one slide. This is conventional dewatering de, uh, de associated with a hydraulic dredging project. So it's the hydraulic method where we're dredging, pumping, lots of water. The next slide is conventional gravity dewatering with a mechanical dredging effort. And that goes back to the first type of dredging we were talking about. Um, it's hard to see, but you can see an excavator. This is the inner harbor of Barnstable, which we just finished last winter. Um, the material is actually in a containment barge. And you see the long reach excavator there is taking the material out of the containment barge, putting it on trucks. The trucks come down. It's maybe like all of a tenth of a mile. There's a containment basin. You can see the tarps there. That's all um, just bermed up, and it's a hole in the middle. Um, the trucks come up to a loading platform, dump the, the sediment in there. And over time, that's the in interior of the basin. You can see the material drying out. And this is just through gravity. Um, and at the end of this basin, there was an outflow, uh, out, outflow device that the water returned back into the harbor. Um, once the material was dried out, it was put into trucks. And in this case, the material is clean enough that we mixed it with uh, natural gravel. And the town created a noise attenuation berm at their shooting range. So what you're seeing on the bottom is the end result of that dredge sediment being mixed and constructed into this noise attenuation berm, um, which was planted with pines on the top. And you can see the erosion matting. That's all seeded. Um, we just finished this like two weeks ago, so there's no grass on there. But hopefully, we'll see some green grass there soon. So that's, that's the end result. That's, that's a great beneficial use of yucky, mucky dredge sediment that turned into uh, being a benefit to the town. And they didn't have to pay for that yucky, mucky dredge. They had to pay to construct the berm, but th there was a huge beneficial use. As opposed to spending $20 a ton to take it to a landfill, they just blended it with material and they made themselves a noise attenuation berm and pleased many of the residents um, that were very disgruntled about the noise that's associated with this facility. Next slide. So we move away from the old, good old fashioned way of gravity. And over the years, I would say especially over the last five to seven years, um, we've gotten into the technology of dewatering. Um, in this particular, these two methods that I'm going to talk about are fairly common from the technological standpoint. But they require a hydraulic dredge. This isn't a mechanical dredge. This has to be a suction uh, dredge where the pipeline connects into these types of um, treatment processes that we'll talk about. First is the mechanical belt press, and the second is the geotube um, technology. So just to kind of explain, forgive my lack of artistic ability here, um, the blue wavy area is our water body, and our hydraulic dredge is sucking in the material down at the bottom, comes through a pipeline, puts it into a holding tank. Sometimes a holding tank is not necessary if the dredge can dredge at the same rate that the belt press can squeeze the water out. But oftentimes, you have a holding tank to just hold sediment. It goes into the, the pipeline that connects into the chemical treatment um, where the polymers are added. And the polymers, what they do is they bind to the sediment to pull them out of suspension so that the water, when it goes into the belt press, the water comes out. It's returned back to the water body. And we end up with these cakes, like sludge. I mean, if you've ever seen wastewater treatment sludge cakes. Um, I call it, it looks very similar to peat moss in a bag. I mean, that's how dry this stuff can be. And it literally comes off in sheets onto a conveyor belt. 
and it goes into a truck and it's hauled off to wherever the disposal site is, is uh, located. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I've got some pictures here. Um, the beauty of this, this type of system is it really does require very little land area to operate. Um, here you can see the, this is, the first slide shows a holding tank where the dredge lines are coming in and the material is being stored. And then these are two side-by-side -side belt presses um, in which the material is being, the, the water is being squeezed out. And if you really look hard, you can see the conveyor belt coming right up into the truck and, and it's trucked away. And this was done, this actually, this pr project done by CLE was back in 2000. And it was really the first time belt presses were used in, in uh, Massachusetts for dewatering of dredge material. So it kind of, this, this project itself opened the eyes to a lot of the uh, regulators that there are other ways to accomplish the goal of dewatering. And it's been used as, as a model for many projects since that time. Um, it's very quick, it's clean, it's quiet. Um, it's a continuous operation. So you're dredging, you're squeezing, and you're trucking. It's all happening at the same time. You're not, you're not requiring land area for the material to sit there over time to dewater because the belt press is squeezing all the water out for you. Um, odors aren't typically a problem. Um, you do require the additive, the polymer, to facilitate the dewatering. Um, and again, the dewatering time is uh, a function of the equipment and the operation capabilities. And what we mean there is um, you can have a number of belt presses sequentially in line based on how quickly you can dredge. Depending on the size of your dredge and your dredge operation, your capacity of your dredge, you, know, you can pump 500 cubic yards a day, you can pump 3,000 cubic yards a day. So the more you can dredge, you have to handle it on the other end. So you have to have adequate belt press capacity to, to handle what you're, you're sucking out of the uh, water body and putting into the belt press. So oftentimes there'll be several belt presses that will be used. Or we can go back to the holding tank idea where you have a, a temporary storage to kind of gap the, the fact that the dredge is a little bit faster than the belt press. This is an on-barge mechanical belt press system. Um, this was a large-scale project, so um, it looks a little daunting. But essentially, it's the same thing that we just talked about, except instead of doing it on land, we've got a water-based barge supporting our belt presses. And next to it, we have the, the, um, the hopper barge in which the material, the dry material, goes into. This would be towed off to some shoreline area for offloading, either into trucks, or it could actually be offloaded um, to a site that is a waterfront facility and, and just reused as fill. So this even um, is less of a, a land-based impact because everything's done in the water. Uh, a lot of the problems we face in dredging is finding enough area to dewater these sediments that can't just be pumped on the beach and used for nourishment. So um, the, the beauty of the mechanical belt press really is it's a very compact type of methodology, very clean, so quiet. It, it, it's very impressive to see. Um, so you can do it on land, and you can also do it on barge. Next, I just want to talk a little bit about the geotube technology. Um, this, again, has kind of been the up-and-coming way to dewater dredge sediments. Again, it's with a hydraulic type of dredging operation, where it's similar in the fact of we've got the dredge, the pipeline coming in, it's chemically treated, and then it's piped into these big, long, large diameter um, geotubes, which are synthetic um, materials that, uh, it's, it's not shown here, but they're, they're placed into like a containment, a, a low berm containment area, and literally the water just seeps out of these bags. They're very, very, very fine um, openings in these bags, and the water seeps out, it collects in the, basin, the little basin area, and the return water goes back into the harbor, it's clean, and all the sediment remains in the bag. This requires a little bit more time than the belt press, because we need to let the water seep out. It's not being squeezed out. Um, so it takes a little bit more time and it does take more land area. The beauty with the geotubes is you can actually stack them on top of each other. So um, as much as we talk about con conventional gravi uh, gravity dewatering, which is large area to dewater, this is much less um, and you can take advantage of the stackability of these bags to even use less area. Once the material dewaters, the bags are cut open and the material is just taken out of the bags, put into a truck, and, and hauled to the disposal site. So we've got some pictures here to kind of give you a feel. These bags are, are huge. <laughs> um, you can see the, the pipelines connecting into the geotube bag, so you've got your little treatment box, and then the material goes into the bags. These are side by side. This doesn't show a stacking um, 
a stacking orientation of the bags. It's just a side-by-side -side operation. And you can see here where they have Jersey barriers. So you can see how the water, although it looks frozen in this picture, um, the water is collected. And, and that basin area is, is slightly graded so that water flows into um, a containment area so that it can return back into the water body. Um, again, it requires more area than a mechanical uh, belt press operation, but certainly not as much as a conventional dewatering operation. And we've got the advantage of the stackability. Um, it's contained. Odors are not typically a problem with this type of um, dewatering. It requires the additive of a polymer to facilitate the dewatering. And um, it, the, the additive reduces the on-site dewatering time um, that you have to wait before you can cut those bags open and, and have a, a material that you can handle and, and truck away. Next. As far as the disposal of dredge sediments go, I mean, there's multiple things that we, we try to figure out what we can do with this stuff. If you're lucky, um, you've got some nice sand material, and this material can be beneficially reused for nourishment. And I think we all can appreciate um, the erosion that we're all seeing um, and the fact that dredging can be used to accomplish two things in one effort, and that's to either um, accomplish some navigation or restoration, but in the meantime, you can also use this material to save our beaches, to, um, to put on the eroded areas to reestablish the beach area. Um, again, that's all sand. We're not talking the fine, silty stuff. Nobody wants that on the beach. We don't use that for nourishment. But what we can use those fines for, um, composting. I did a job um, not too long ago where it was Phragmites. Um, it was a long stretch, like a mile and a half. Of, it was more for flood control to get the Phragmites out. So we ended up removing the Phragmites below their root mass, which is hard in itself, but we also had sediment. So what we ended up doing is um, basically grinding down the Phragmites and, and mixing it with the sediment, and then we ended up bringing it to the local composting uh, facility. And uh, it was monitored, and, and it was turned into reusable compost. Um, we've also used dredge sediment for the purposes of agricultural needs, if it's organic. A lot of this stuff is good, juicy material um, that can be reused in an agricultural manner. Landscaping, uh, we, like, I guess the noise attenuation berm, for a lack of a, an example, um, it's, it's just a berm. It's, it, it's nothing special, and it, it's providing some landscape capability. It's a good way to, to use the sediment. It's a lot cheaper to reuse these sediments in these ways than to look at a landfill. Um, and quite frankly, the agencies are looking for beneficial reuse. Um, it's, it's a preferred disposal option if, in fact, the, the, the project warrants it. Um, we've used dredge sediments in roadway sub-base. We've used it for filling in um, areas of um, commercial areas that just need to fill in um, holes for mining things. Um, it, it really has unlimited uses, provided that the physical characteristics of the dredge sediment meet the need and the contaminant levels meet the thresholds that allow this material to be reused in these types of, uh, these type of cases. The landfill facility, always ugly, always expensive. Uh, sometimes we have to go there. Um, but it can be a beneficial reuse for daily cover. Um, a lot of the landfills um, like to use this stuff. Um, it's not as expensive if it's going to be beneficially reused as opposed to actually physically having to dispose it into the landfill itself. Um, we don't like to use landfill disposal unless you have to, uh, unless the contaminant levels are high enough that it warrants it. And as it is, landfill space is coming at a premium. And um, a lot of these facilities aren't extremely happy about dredge sediment taking up their space for other needs. So that's becoming an issue. Um, land, landfill disposal, it was always the fall to of disposal if you can't find any other place to take it. But uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to actually have land, landfill disposal as an option. Shoreline contained disposal facilities. Um, basically, that, that artificial dune would, um, in Barnstable Harbor, down by Sandy Neck, um, that would basically call the shoreline containment facility, where we're just putting it right on the shoreline. We're holding it in a dune. Um, but we also can build bulkheads, where material can put behind bulkheads um, right along the shoreline. So that would be a contained disposal facility. Um, again, all of these um, above typically dewatering is part of the operation. But when we get into the offshore, which we were talking about earlier, um, at the regulated sites, um, there's no need to dewater, which is great. It saves you time, it saves you money. Um, and then there's near shore disposal, in which there's areas that can be sited um, that typically, I don't know, hundreds of feet off the immediate shoreline. And the idea is 
um, if the material is suitable, more sandy, uh, beach nourishment like, um, to put these in these near shore areas and allow wave action in Mother Nature to push these materials back up on the beach. So near shore disposal is something that's used. Um, and that doesn't obviously, no, no dewatering because we're taking it out of the water and we're putting it back in the water. And then there's the confined aquatic disposal, um, which is also known as a CAD cell, which is basically an underwater landfill. Uh, New Bedford Harbor is constructing these um, in which uh, a cavity in the, the base of um, the ocean is dug out like a, a landfill. Um, the material is contaminated. It's put into the, the, um, the confined cell and then it's capped with clean material. So it really is kind of like an underwater landfill. Um, these are, like I said, New Bedford Harbor has these, um, I'm trying to think where else. I think Buzz's Bay was trying to get one years ago, but I don't think it was ever permitted. Part of the problem with confined aquatic disposal is it adds another layer to permitting because you're actually creating that as well as your dredging. And to find the location and to site these things, it gets very expensive, very complicated because you have to account for digging a hole in the marine environment and what are the impacts of doing that. So um, the, the CAD cell, it's, it's a solution. It's an expensive solution. And um, there's pros and cons to, to moving forward with those. But we're not seeing that many of them just because of the, uh, the, the tight regulations that are involved with actually siting and permitting a site like that. So I'm not going to get into the real boring part of what I do, but unfortunately, this is the worst part of what I do in terms of getting all of the regulatory approvals necessary to con conduct a dredging project. And for the most part, what you're seeing on these bulleted items are pretty much all of the permits you're going to need for most of what we do in, in the world of dredging. Um, it's layer upon layer, um, a lot of redundancy. Uh, someday in the perfect world, it might be one application and everybody checks a box. But um, this is what adds a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of just going around in the same circle, but just with a different person that's reviewing it. it, it it's a very uh, timely and it can be a very costly endeavor to permit a dredge project. So we start with the Local Conservation Commission, which more than not is going to have um, involvement in any type of dredging project. Um, that would be through the notice of intent. And dependent upon the areas that we are proposing work, whether it be in the water body itself or shoreline areas, um, there are mapped areas um, throughout the Commonwealth as endangered um, habitat, whether it be wildlife or um, vegetation. So we need to see if any of our work is going to fall within the jurisdiction. And if it does, uh, piping plover, I'm sure everyone has heard of the plover. Um, that's where this all comes from, the oversight. Uh, so we have to go through a, a MISA determination with them to see if the, the proposed work is significant enough to impact whatever the protected species, in, species is. And if they determine it is, um, it, there's a lot of mitigation. You have to basically make up for the loss, which costs you more money, which costs you more time, which needs to get the permitted. So you can kind of see how these things can really snowball. Um, the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, the MEPA program, um, it's kind of the, the beginning steps of um, not just dredging. It can be any, any kind of work, environmental work that we do. Um, but what that does is it, it, it gives a comprehensive overview of the project. And that is um, through an environmental notification form. Or if it's significant enough impacts, it's an um, environmental impact report. And we put all this information together. And it's circulated to all of these guys that still have their permit process. But we give it to them early on to get initial feedback, to um, have them you know, bring to our attention what issues we should plan on addressing in our applications when we start filing with the state and federal um, regulators. So the MEPA process is kind of a comprehensive starting point um, to get it out there to the regulators and get their input and see where the red flags may be so that we can address it before we submit an application, trying to nip a lot of this in the bud, if at all possible. Um, then we. Continue on to the state process. Uh, DEP has multiple uh, places where we need to get approval. First is water quality. Um, water quality is permitted in, in the Boston office in DEP. And essentially, that's needed for any kind of dredge uh, project that we uh, are proposing. It's any kind of filling that you may be doing, beach nourishment below high tide. Um, we need a water quality certification. And they, can, they have the ability to approve the beneficial reuse of dredge material provided it's clean enough. 
if the material isn't clean enough by their standards, and I can't even begin to explain all that, um, if it's not clean enough, then you have to go to the regional office and you have to go to solid waste. And they actually review it as a solid waste. And you have to get a beneficial use determination to reuse this material for the purpose that you intend it to be used for. You still need a water quality certification, but now you need the beneficial use determination. And then one last stop at DEP is a Chapter 91 dredge permit. Um, those are typically required whenever you do any kind of work in um, tidelands uh, or any filled tidelands. So oftentimes we need a Chapter 91 permit from the Waterways Division. Then we move up to the federal level where we have the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which has um, jurisdiction within navigable waterways. And um, they essentially uh, they provide the application to multiple state and federal agencies. We're talking EPA, Division of Marine Fisheries, National Marine Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So within the Army Corps permit application, you got all these other agencies reviewing the application, providing input, uh, saying, you know, you're proposing to dredge an acre of valuable shellfish habitat. You got to mitigate. You can't do this. Try to minimize those impacts. So you get all kinds of input at the federal level from both state and federal agencies. Um, so that, that, that's a, a very broad-based review. Um, we also have uh, Mass Coastal Zone Management, federal consistency. They're part of the core permit review, but if the work is at a certain level, then we actually have to get a separate approval from them, even though they're reviewing the core permit. Um, and then we often have local requirements. Um, a lot of times we have to go to planning boards, we have to go to zoning boards, um, depending on the, um, the bylaw of the community in which we're trying to get permits. So um, I'm just tired of talking about this. <laughs> uh, as you can see, there's many, many layers to the regulatory process. Um, and in addition, you've got DEP and the Army Corps of Engineers they're going to tell you if your dredge sediment is clean enough to do with what you want to do with it. So that's not a permit, that's a suitability determination. So they also have that um, oversight as well as the actual reuse of the material. So a lot of time, a lot of money, um, it, it, it can be simple. Um, if we're talking a project, a maintenance dredging project, the difference being it's something that is an established, for instance, channel um, where it's been dredged multiple times. Uh, you go through and do a maintenance dredging project, it has a little less uh, scrutiny involved because the environment has been maintained in a dredge state for so many years. Um, a little less complicated, usually, unless you're proposing to dredge above mean low water, and now we have intertidal impacts, which has all kinds of issues with the benthic critters and the shellfish and all those kind of things. Um, but anyhow, nevertheless, uh, you know, we, we get through these, these permits uh, and, and we try to be as cost effective as we can, but oftentimes um, as we go through the pro process, some issues are brought to our attention. Mitigation, mitigation is, is, is a tough thing in that if you can't avoid the impact to dredge, then what you're required to do is mitigate for it. For instance, if we're gonna dredge something that has some shellfish habitat, the mitigation may require you to establish habitat of equal size someplace else. So it's kind of a trade-off that these agencies are looking not to lose the habitat. Maybe a relocation of the habitat would be acceptable. But again, easier said than done. I use shellfish just as an example. It's a simple one. But uh, we're dealing with some intertidal dredging right now where um, we don't really have that opportunity to mitigate. There's no place to do it within the area we want to dredge. So now we're looking at water quality improvements. Um, putting in measures to um, minimize um, sediment runoff coming from streets into outfall areas because that in turn improves shellfish habitat and the intertidal habitat. So you get, you get all kinds of um, mitigatory requirements in some of these projects and it, sometimes it's really hard to find a way to mitigate for the impact of the dredge itself. Maintenance dredging is one thing. Improvement dredging is someplace that's never been dredged before. All of a sudden, uh, there's no record of it being dredged or there's a new need to dredge a water body, what have you. And improvement dredging is going to be scrutinized a lot at a higher level than typically a maintenance dredging project will be. But um, anyways, as you, I, I'm sure, sure you can appreciate all those bullets, um, lots of words, lots of time, lots of money. And um, if you go to the next slide, I think we're good. <laughs>